Minister. Please. All right. Uh, Madam President, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation just attempted by Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the Senate resolved that if Senator Matthias Cormann did not lay key documents on the table relating to the $2 billion Roe Highway disaster in Perth, that he would be required to attend the chamber at this time to provide an explanation for his failure to do so. Now, it's the first time in recent memory, certainly the first time since I've been here, that the Senate has raised the stakes in this way. Anyone who has been in the chamber for more than a few weeks will know that orders for production of documents are an essential practical tool of transparency. In, in the Greens, we've got an undertaking to our colleagues on the crossbenchers and the opposition that, unless there are unusual circumstances, we will generally support them in requesting documents from the government, whether it's something that we're personally interested in or not. In my view, it is part of the Senate's job to do this. If you go to the Hansard, you'll see we supported numerous Liberal and National Party orders when we were in opposition, or when, when they were in opposition. And you can spend a year getting snowed in the labyrinth of freedom of information obstruction, or you can come in here and order that things be tabled on much shorter deadlines, obviously within reason. So when I first showed up here in 2008, I can remember it being a pretty big deal for a government to defy such an order. Governments either handed material over or they provided a compelling reason why it wasn't in the public interest to do so, or they copped the consequences. Now, in the New South Wales Parliament, they've had a mechanism for many years where, in the event of a standoff between the Parliament and a minister, an independent arbiter would be called on to determine if the minister's excuse was valid or not. And it works. Ministers know that if their public interest excuse is watertight, they have an independent umpire that will back them up. The Parliament knows that there's an independent check and balance in the system to prevent the kinds of abuse of process that we are bearing witness to today. And I hope that Senator Rhiannon will go into more detail about how this worked in the New South Wales context. In 2010, Senators Brown and Milne and the member for Melbourne, Adam Bant, got agreement from Ms Julia Gillard to introduce such a mechanism into the Senate. And two years later, they formally reneged. But I can remember at the time that one of my fiercest allies in the quest to hold the government to their agreement was none other than Senator Matthias Cormann. This is what he said in 2009. He said, I am sincerely shocked at how quickly this government have turned into a secretive government. I'm not going to try and do the accent, but these are his words. I'm shocked at the long and detailed presentation we've just had from the government, which essentially sums up one thing. They are running scared from openness, transparency and public accountability. This runs counter to everything that they have said, not only before the last election, but also since. I will quote, again, this is Senator Cormann, I will quote a statement made by Senator John Faulkner at a recent conference. The speech, entitled Open and Transparent Government, the way forward was made at Australia's Right to Know Freedom of Speech Conference. <clears throat> he said, the best safeguard against ill-informed public judgment is not concealment, but information. As Abraham Lincoln said, let the people know the facts and the country will be safe. Now, apologies that that's a bit of a Russian doll of a quote. For Hansard's benefit, that's Senator Cormann quoting Senator Faulkner, quoting Abraham Lincoln. And so the Senate has no recourse to an independent umpire. There's no one we can go to to check the validity of the kind of claims that Senator Cormann is asking us to trust him on. Because the reason we don't have such an umpire is that Senator Cormann's crusade for such an office mysteriously evaporated right after the Liberal National Party won government. So in the absence of such an umpire, the Senate has to figure out what other consequences it believes are appropriate. Now, when Senator Minchin, just to give you one example, was communications minister, we supported him in sanctioning Senator Stephen Conroy over key reports relating to the NBN. After Senator Conroy had defied a number of these Senate orders to produce documents, the Senate determined by majority that it would not deal with any legislation in his portfolio uh, until he fronted up. And months later, we got a lot more than the minister was initially willing to hand over. In other words, it was worth raising the stakes. But it's a very long time since the Senate has asserted itself in this way. And meantime, standards of transparency and accountability have fallen apart. And I cannot remember a time when such casual contempt has been shown to this Senate and to its role, to the crossbench and to the opposition who hold a majority in here and are sent here to do a job. What happened to Senator Cormann? Where is our transparency warrior today? For the benefit of those listening on broadcast, he left the room. Today marks the seventh time that the minister has defied Senate orders drafted in various ways, demanding disclosure on this $2 billion dead dog of a project. And for senators not from Western Australia, you probably know what I'm referring to. $1.2 billion 
of your taxes uh, going to fund an environmental obscenity. The Western Australian community have every right to believe that the minister this morning is abusing his position and the very principles of public interest that he fought so hard in favour for when he was in opposition. Release the full business case. Release the cost-benefit analysis. Otherwise, we have to assume that you're hiding something. Senator Common made reference to the fact that the top-line figures for this project had, in fact, been released, and he's quite right. There's a summary of the business case in the public domain. There's a summary of the cost-benefit analysis in the public domain. But we know what is actually going on here. Prime Minister Tony Abbott, the roads are good for the environment, roads are good for mental health, Prime Minister. These are direct quotes, believe it or not introduced as part of his big push to be the infrastructure concrete through wetlands prime minister introduced three uh, road projects i think effectively on the same day west connects the east west link and the row highway extension basically just came out and said these things no work's been done on them but the commonwealth will be funding them because i am the concrete pouring prime minister on the on the infrastructure prime minister and then it is basically left to the infrastructure department and the state uh, main roads departments and planning authorities to retrospectively justify these disastrous projects. It is a complete perversion of due process. And that happened in three states at the same time. Our Victorian colleagues managed to checkmate theirs, and New South Wales colleagues are well on their way uh, to checkmating theirs. And in fact, in Victoria, that project cost the Napthine government office. And in Western Australia, we are three and a half weeks away from seeing an eerily similar repeat of the same debacle, where this, this ghost project introduced by Tony Abbott that's had its head severed, still shambling along like a zombie, a $2 billion zombie that apparently can only be stopped by an election. And that's our task in the next three and a half weeks. But what happens is we get these top line figures that Senator Cormann dances in here, and, and maybe Senator Back will, will um, give us some information from those as well. But what we are asked to do is simply trust the top line figures. We are asked to trust the government and the analysts who rapidly, hastily did this work to justify the preemptive announcement of Prime Minister Abbott in Premier Colin Barnett. Trust us, the cost benefit analysis stacks up. Trust us, the business case stacks up. We know from consultants, whistleblowers, people who have worked on these things that the numbers don't stack up. And that is the reason why Senator Cormann can't release it. That's why they're not being put into the public domain, because the numbers don't stack up. And of course they don't, because Prime Minister Tony Abbott announced these projects without that due diligence having been done. The Labor Party, to their credit, when they were in government, introduced this thing called Infrastructure Australia that created the first instance of an arm's length assessment process um, between uh, a proponent and uh, consolidated revenue so that you wouldn't just get National Party MPs stamping around in their electorates out, out uh, announcing freeway projects and bridges and tunnels and ports willy-nilly. And the government, as one of their first acts as, with Tony Abbott as Prime Minister, reversed this process. And you have these, um, these prime ministerial announcements that he gets to hang out in a fluoro vest and a hard hat for the TV cameras announcing roads that everybody else then has to go away and try and justify. That's why they're not putting this material into the public domain. And what happens is you have these black box projects where contractors are invited to submit their bids, and at that point everything disappears into this shroud of commercial inconfidence. That's what happens. That's the other justification. What we were told was, while this tender process is live, this was the excuse from a year ago, while the tender process is live, we're not going to release any of the information. You can't have the business case or the CBA because that will prejudice commercial negotiations. That's commercial inconfidence. Personally, I was of the view at the time, and we were backed up by a majority of the Senate at the time, that that was garbage, that you redact the documents, you put them into the public domain. But the fact is it's not out for tender. Leighton's won. They got wonderful value for money for their $700,000 donations to the Liberal National Parties. They got the gig. We have no idea why they got the gig, but they did. And so that argument you would have thought of commercial confidentiality has been wiped away. There's no possibility, really, that an independent arbiter, if we had one, in the Senate to break these deadlocks would uphold the minister's contention that because of some tender process that finished up six months ago, they can't put the primary information into the public domain so that people can analyse it. And yet that is effectively what Minister Cormann just did, and I presume his colleagues are going to back him in. Stand up and say, you just have to trust us, it's all commercial inconfidence. And they're going to do that to stage two. So 
uh, State Transport Minister Dean Nowder gone, not forgotten, not particularly missed either, who was pushing for a tunnel costing another $600, $700, $800 million uh, under Stock Road. Presumably, when Labor senators, independents and the Greens and our state parliamentary colleagues try to figure out where the exhaust stacks, taking carcinogenic pollution from this hideously expensive tunnel and venting it into suburban areas, when we try to find out where those are going to be, we'll be told that's commercial inconfidence as well. It's obscene. But that is what we're faced with. Now, you will be aware that one of the key arguments against this project there are two. Firstly, uh, there are a great many more than two, but the key ones that I want to focus on today. Firstly, it doesn't have to happen. Work that was done under the court state Liberal government in the 1990s identified that we were going at some stage to need an overflow port in Coburn Sound. That work was picked up and run with by the state Labor government for a period of years. A whole heap of due diligence has been done that we would have thought um, had cross-party support by now that the container port in Fremantle Harbour is approaching capacity, not just the laydown areas and the container yards, but in fact the approach roads, and that at some point you're going to need to either take container traffic or bulk freight into Coburn Sound, into the industrial area that has great road links, that has great rail links with the Kewdale industrial area and the airport, that that really is where we should be starting to move our freight task to. Fremantle stays as a working port, but the overflow traffic, particularly either the container traffic or the bulk freight, goes down to Coburn Sound. All of that work had been done, which means really that project should be moved forward for a proper environmental impact assessment. In the Senate here, we don't get to just stand here and say that it should go ahead. What we are saying is that's a live option that should be investigated and submitted for environmental impact assessment. But no, the government on the, the, the zombie commitment of Prime Minister Tony Abbott is determined to push ahead of it, and now it is going to cost the Barnett government office. That is a determination and a commitment that we make in here today. The other issue, obviously, is that the project is an environmental and Aboriginal heritage obscenity. This is four lanes, possibly eight lanes of tarmac, six, eight lanes. We're not even sure how big this thing is eventually going to get, pushing through wetlands and an incredibly important Aboriginal heritage area. 40 or 50,000 years of continuous occupation of the Swan Coastal Plain. And we know, and I'm not in here to speak for the Aboriginal mob, they have been speaking for themselves. At events that we've been to, in the courts, uh, in here we've had delegations and we have had people um, who, have very, very, uh, who have stood up with a great deal of determination to make their case that uh, destroying sites in this way, and it's a one-two punch from the state and the Commonwealth, the Barnett government deregisters sacred sites that have been on the statute books for decades. Then the Commonwealth government writes out a billion dollar cheque to cover them in, in asphalt. It's absolutely obscene. And you always know that you're going to get done over in one of these things when the proponent, in this case Main Roads Department, boasts of stringent conditions that the project will be subjected to. Uh, we have observed and campaigners on the ground doing the job that should have been done by state and federal environmental compliance officers have observed literally hundreds of breaches of environmental conditions. Now, 53 of them are recorded with photographic evidence in a letter that I've got here today that has been sent to Environment Minister Josh Frydenberg. And what I might do, because I'm going to refer to it briefly, it has been to the government and opposition whips, is seek leave to table that correspondence now and then I can refer to it and is other it, senators will have it. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Well, that's remarkable. I'm presuming that that wasn't from the Labor side. I believe that, that was, leave was denied from the government side. Senator Firefield, you live a long way from Western Australia. I would have thought you would appreciate having the evidence to hand. That letter's gone to, Senator, uh, to Minister Frydenberg. And what it does is identify an extraordinary pattern of non-compliance with the very environmental conditions that we were promised would lead to the kind of world's best practice that Senator Cormann was going on a short time ago. But guess what? We have been advised that the senior compliance manager at the EPA, so that's the state environmental watchdog, has stated that the agency does not have the power to suspend works no matter how serious the breaches of ministerial conditions may be. No matter how serious the breaches are, the state government does not have the power to stop work. So why the hell do we bother? Why do we bother with state environmental law? The reason that we bother, the reason that governments keep these fig leaves around them is so that they can wave around these lists of stringent conditions and they are being violated by the dozens and by the hundreds every single day on the ground. And we know that this is occurring because it is being documented. 
So this letter, if the uh, government senators had done me the courtesy after we tipped them off uh, to actually be faced with the evidence, I understand why you'd be a bit unwilling to do that, but the letter has 18 pages of evidence. We outlined 53 very clear uh, photographically backed up breaches of the ministerial conditions that Minister Frydenberg believes uh, are guiding environmental conduct at this project. Endangered quenders being tracked trapped just 90 minutes before bulldozers roll in, in breach of the fauna management plan that he signed off. Why bother doing a fauna management plan if you don't care whether or not it's being upheld on the ground? Missing surveys of nesting hollows of the iconic and endangered Carnaby's black cockatoo. We are running out of the kind of ecosystems and habitat that can support these endangered creatures. They are iconic. Anybody who has been to Western Australia Senator Back will know this. Senator Reynolds, we've got a reasonably good cross-section of Western Australian senators here. These species are going to be locally extinct on the Swan Coastal Plain unless something is done. But what the Barnett government is doing, with cheques cashed by the Commonwealth government, is wiping out another 100 hectares of their habitat and saying, well, if they fly 120 kilometres further south, we've changed some lines on a map and we've created some offsets. We don't believe that those surveys were even done. And if that is the case, and the evidence that we have in this letter uh, makes it very clear that it is the case, then this project is proceeding illegally. This project is proceeding unlawfully in violation of a dozen or more of the conditions that the government placed upon it. So I want to know how serious does a breach have to get before Minister Frydenberg stops the clock? Because if he doesn't stop the clock, the clock will be stopped by the electorate of Western Australia on the 11th of March when the hopeless, bitter, clapped-out talent vacuum that we've come to know as the Barnett government is thrown out of office once and for all. That's how we will stop the clock. It won't prevent the extraordinary damage that's been done, but at least it will give us the opportunity to wind some of it back. As we speak this afternoon, I've been advised that contractors have started clearing Section 5 this morning. It's an incredibly sensitive wetland habitat. People right now on the ground have described it's beautiful. There are balgas, huge majestic old tuits, thick bushland, cockatoos circling living in the trees. There's rainbow bee-eater nests there. We know that they have caught quenders, so the endangered southern brown bandicoots in the area, uh, as recently as yesterday morning. I do want to acknowledge, in the brief period of time that I've got left, special thanks to Andrew Yoska, Naomi Ciceris, Seba, and the rest of the extraordinary team of volunteers working around the clock under the incredible guidance of Phoebe Cork. And they are taking up the work that EPA and Commonwealth compliance officers should have taken up to monitor compliance breaches on site every day. So it's not even that we don't have eyes on the ground. If the state government and if Minister Frydenberg were interested in the evidence, the evidence is there that they are in flagrant violation of the conditions that the state and Commonwealth put on them. There are people like Rex and Felicity who have been at this campaign for 30 years. There are people like Kate Kelly and Kim Dravniks, campaigners of incredible standing and wisdom, and they know the history uh, of this area. But there are also everyday people, mothers and friends, people like you out there listening, that were so moved to protect this precious place that they took on the courts, they formed an alliance with more, more than 30 disparate groups, and they have waged a very, very powerful war against this thing. Every local council in the area is opposed to this but ignored. Friends of mine, very close friends and colleagues, have been arrested down there in very well-disciplined, non-violent direct actions, where basically you say, I know I'm going to be breaking a law, I will take the consequences. That's how strongly I feel about protecting this extraordinary bit of bush. We have stood shoulder to shoulder with independents. We have stood shoulder to shoulder with Labor MPs, both state and federal, with councillors from across the political spectrum, and with residents not just from the impact area, but right across Perth Metro. And this campaign has gone national, and so it should, because it is national Commonwealth taxpayer dollars that are paying for it. If your hospital or transport system in Western Sydney is run down, if you're in outer suburban Melbourne and you don't have cycleways or you don't have decent schools, it's partly because uh, Tony Abbott committed two, uh, a billion dollars of Commonwealth money to this project without even knowing where it was. He probably couldn't even have pointed to it on a map. I also want to acknowledge my dear colleague Lynn McLaren MLC, who's been the state member for the South Metropolitan Region for eight years and hopefully many more years. The Greens, Labor Party, the Independents, even Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party came out and condemned it. How bad does a project have to be before One Nation sit up and take notice? I think it'll be to their regret that they then proposed the, to preference 
the very same people who are driving the bulldozers. But nonetheless, this has very strong and deep cross-party community support, and it's going to bury the Barnett government come March 11. Thank you, Senator.